Can OpenAI's ChatGPT help you learn Python? If you're a beginner, the answer is yes. But if you want to learn more intermediate or advanced features, you're going to encounter some problems. By the way, it's almost Easter and we have these little chocolate eggs in the Netherlands. I mean, you sure have them as well. I mean, they're like horrible. I mean, I absolutely can't restrain myself. It's like, while true, eat chocolate Easter eggs. I don't know if you know that feeling. You are my nemesis. Anyway, today I'm going to take a look at a relatively new field called prompt engineering and give you five tips to help you use AI tools like ChatGPT more effectively. Once an API has built an awesome software application for you, you need to host it somewhere. There's no AI for that yet, but fortunately, there are companies like Hostinger who solve this really nicely, and they're also the sponsor of this video. If you need a website or if you want to host your Python backend, Hostinger makes this really easy. You can choose from shared, cloud and VPS hosting plans. In particular, cloud and VPS are a great option for hosting your app and launching it online. Each cloud hosting plan includes 300 websites, SSD storage, free domain, backups, email, really great website builder, and a very complete WordPress hosting solution. If you use the VPS, you get full root access, a dedicated IP address, and much more. Really everything you need. And you can get a VPS plan starting at only $3.99 per month. And if you use the discount code IronCode, you're going to get an additional 10% off. Setting up a cloud hosting plan is really easy. After you've logged in, just click Start Now, select whether you want a new website or migrate your website. So I'm going to select creating a new website, and then you can choose between whether you want a hosting or builder or whether you want to run it on WordPress. So I'm going to simply select the hosting or builder now, and then you can attach your domain. I'll just choose a temporary domain for the time being because I'm already have enough domains, now we can create the website. And since this is an AI focused video, let's use the AI website builder and see what happens. So my brand name is obviously Iron Code. My website type is YouTube content creator. So let's pick a YouTube site and business description. I help software developers become better at software design. And now we're going to create a new website based on this information. And this is what it looks like. Setting up a VPS is also really easy. After you've selected your VPS plan and logged in, you can simply click start now and then pick your location. So I'm of course based in the Netherlands, so I want a Dutch server. Click continue and now I can choose the operating system. So you can have either a plain OS or you can select an operating system with a control panel and they also have a game specific version. So I'm going to use the control panel version and this is built with CentOS and then I simply select the default panel. I'll set a password now for the control panel. We can give the server a name, so let's call that iron.code and we can also set a secure root password. There we go and save and continue. So that all looks good. So now I'm just going to finish the setup. They offer 24 seven support, so you'll never feel lost. Over 1.5 website owners trust Hostinger and with a 30 day money back guarantee, you can try it risk-free. Click the link in the description to get started. Now let's go back to the video. What's really important if you use tools like ChatGPT or other AI chatting tools is that you think about how you phrase your questions and what is the sequence in which you ask the questions, how precise are you going to be, etc. So there's a pretty new field called prompt engineering that focuses on ways to formulate your questions correctly so you get the most out of it. I do find that a lot of these prompt engineering techniques work well when you're dealing with code, but they're also for a big part focused on editing text. So when you're dealing with code, there are some limitations that you should know about and that I'll also talk about in this video. But what I want to do today is show basically five tips, five techniques that help you get more out of tools like ChatGPT. So the first tip is to make sure that you're clear about the context. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to indicate the context of the question. So what kind of programming language do you want the chatbot to use? Is it supposed to be an exercise? Is it supposed to be an explanation? Uh, who's it for? And so on and so on. So for example, here I have a ChatGPT window open. So let's say I want to ask it about an algorithm to validate an email address. So I can do write a function 
that validates an email address string like so. So see, it now created a Python function. I didn't indicate that it should use Python. Probably it detected that I'm a Python guru. So that's why it made it in Python. But if you want something else, then of course you're going to have to indicate that. And another thing is that it's assuming that I know what's a function, that I know what's a regular expression, etc., etc. Also, if you look at the code, honestly, it's a bit crappy. Like, I mean, here, this is already a Boolean value. So why do we have to use an if else statement would just return this as boolean it's much simpler also it's not using a main function there are no type hints so i would certainly not approve this code as being high quality python code but we can ask chat gpt to provide a different context for example do the same but use typescript instead so now you see we get a new version of the code but now the context is different because we're asking for a typescript example also since it's typescript there are now type annotations which i much prefer the default context that JetGPT uses here is explain things but maybe you want to change that so that it actually proposes you an exercise so let's ask it to write an exercise instead and see what that looks like So again, I'm being really specific. I want to write an exercise, take me step by step. So I don't just want to ask the question and I want it to be a function. It needs to validate email addresses and it needs to be in Python and see what it comes up with. So here's the exercise that it generated. So the steps are actually pretty straightforward. It makes a lot of sense. And I think this is a really good exercise for, let's say a beginner programmer that wants to learn Python, how to write functions and so on and so on. But let's say we want to condense the exercise a bit and aim it more towards intermediate or advanced programmers. We can actually ask ChatGPT to do that for us. So it's pretty clear ChatGPT actually thinks that refining the regex pattern is one of the key things that a senior developer wants to do. So it wants us to generate a pattern like this, which is completely nuts. So ChatGPT has now reached the maximum character limit because it wants to create this really ridiculously long regular expression type. I was hoping it would condense the steps a bit more in fewer steps, which would make more sense for a senior developer. Let's go the other way around. Okay, so this is interesting. Already the first step is different in that it wants you to install Python. It's assuming you don't have Python installed, which makes a lot of sense. And the steps as they are being generated here also look like they're being more basic. So it wants us to open the text editor or IDE. So that's of course more suitable to how a beginner would do it. As you can see, it also explains things more. So it says that if it takes an email address as an input, it indicates that this is called an argument. And it explains things like the pass keyword. Also, instead of letting you come up with the regex pattern, it really provides the code directly and instructs you to type the following code inside the function. So the level of the exercise is clearly different. So as you can see, the context here is really important. Is it for beginners? Is it for advanced programmers? Is it a Explanation, should it be an exercise, and so on, context. The second tip is that you can use synonyms in order to get different or in some cases better answers. For example, you could use related terms like single responsibility or um, cohesion, which kind of relate to the same thing to get different kinds of answers. So here's an example of what I mean. So I've asked ChatGPT for a function with low cohesion. So it gives me an example, calculate employee salary that does a ton of different things. So that's a pretty clear explanation of what low cohesion is. But we can also formulate it using the single responsibility principle. So now you see it actually gives a completely different example. So here it's about processing the order. It also details the steps, which is quite similar to what it did in the low cohesion version. But then it actually also provides some details of, okay, how can you refactor this? So in this case, I think phrasing the question using single responsibility principle is more useful than phrasing it with low cohesion. So use these synonyms then and try different things to figure out which gives you the best result. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, give it a like. The next tip is that you can give ChatGPT an indication of how you want the answer to be formatted. So for example, 
I'm going to ask it a question of what the structure of a database is for a particular application. So I'm asking it for a database structure of an application that's a sort of quiz editor and see what it comes up with. So it defines users, so there's a user ID, username, it gives some SQL types, which is quite useful, and it presents this in bullet points. There's quizzes that belong to a user, and each quiz has questions, so the structure actually makes a lot of sense. So it suggests us to use six tables, users, quizzes, questions, so quiz has questions, choices, we have quiz attempts, and per quiz attempts we have the user answers. So, well, you know, this could work, sort of. But we didn't give ChatGPT any indication of how to provide the information to us, and this is maybe not the ideal way of representing this information, because it's kind of hard to get the overview. So we can also be more explicit about how we want the information to be presented to us. For example, we could do this. So unfortunately, it looks like it's not able to generate visual diagrams. Let's try something else. Okay, so it seems it also can't generate a mermaid diagram. Let's try something else. So depending on the way that you ask the question and what you ask it to provide you as a result, you're going to get a different type of answer. So here it actually attempts in Ruby, which is interesting, a uh, sort of textual representation of how these things are connected. Another example of indicating how you want to receive the answer is by being more specific about the types of things you want ChatGPT to include. For example, the validate credit card function doesn't have any type hints, so I can simply ask it to do that. Here you see it now has added type hints for the argument and for the return value. Another tip is that you can chain questions. I've already sort of done this in my previous examples, but by chaining things and by letting ChatGPT use the context of the previous questions, you can actually get better answers as a result. For example, let's start by asking it to explain data classes to me. So this is a pretty open question. Uh, it started by simply explaining the basics of data classes, but now, of course, we can start asking follow-up questions and we can refer to the context that it's been using. In this case, that's a person class. For example, we can ask it to expand on the person class by allowing for, let's say, default values. So what it did now is it modified the person class to have a default age of 18. But let's say we want to know a bit more about how data classes work, and in particular what an option like frozen actually does. So we can ask it a follow-up question. So now it basically explains what frozen is. It adds it as an option to the person class and then shows an example of how you use it and when it's going to raise an error. And what happens if you try to modify the person's age, which obviously doesn't work because it's of type frozen. The final tip, and that's especially when you use ChatGPT to generate code, is that you have to realize that ChatGPT makes mistakes, so you should always check the responses. I have an example here that demonstrates this quite nicely. I started by asking ChatGPT to give me an example of the bridge design pattern in Python. So it gives me an example of the bridge design pattern. So there's a uh, draw API, it has a draw method, and then it has shapes. So there's a red circle and a green rectangle in this case. And then there's a shape class, and then we have a circle. That's a refined abstraction of the shape class. So this looks like it could be a bridge pattern, but actually it's not really a bridge pattern. With the bridge pattern, what you basically have is two separate hierarchies. So for example, you would have a hierarchy of shapes. So we have a shape superclass, and then we have a circle and a rectangle and other types of shapes. And then you would have a second hierarchy that is something else. For example, that could be OpenGL, DirectX, Metal, anything else. And these two hierarchies are separate, and the bridge pattern makes the connection between these two things on the abstract level. So it sort of does that, but the example doesn't make a lot of sense. So 
Then I tried as a second question, hey, maybe you should then use a different example. Maybe we get something else. I explained there should be two hierarchies, one hierarchy of message types and a second hierarchy of message sender services. So this makes more sense to me as this is closer to what the bridge pattern is supposed to do. So let's see what it comes up with. So now you see it has a message sender and then there's SMS and Telegram. And then it has an abstraction, which is a message type and then it has text and email. So here again, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because why would you send an email to via SMS? You know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So again, I give it more specific instructions. So instead of text messages and email messages, use text, HTML and markdown. So it's more about the formatting. So now it starts to make a bit more sense. We have the message sender, which is via SMS or Telegram. And we have the message, which has a sender, that is either a text message or an HTML message or a markdown message. So this definitely makes more sense. What it clearly shows though, is that in particular with design patterns, which are, let's say conceptually can be pretty complex. It's actually pretty hard for an AI like ChatGPT to generate this correctly. So you have to really pay attention that it actually explains these patterns correctly. And it makes a lot of sense that it doesn't really do this really well because the way that ChatGPT works is that it's simply trying to generate text based on the text that's already been generated and what it found on the internet, right? So when concepts get more complex, the chance of introducing errors in the explanations is also going to go up. Another problem with this is that you will find way more beginner focused content on the internet than intermediate and advanced content. So the quality of the beginner focused content is going to be much better than the intermediate advanced content. So to round off this video, here are three things that I think are also issues with ChatGPT, especially for more intermediate and advanced content. So the first is that if you're asking it to do advanced things, less basic things, then you're also going to quickly run into limitations of how much text it can actually generate because there's a character limit. For example, you see that already happening here in the simple explanation of the bridge pattern where it has all these classes, but it's not able to complete the code example because it ran out of characters. And we also saw that in the email validation function where, well, because we ask it to rewrite it for senior developers, it tried to generate like a huge uh, regular expression string. And then, well, it ran out of characters and too bad it couldn't, wasn't able to finish the example. So there's a limit to how much text ChatGPT can generate, and that might not be enough to handle the complex cases. Maybe in the future, this will be better, but currently this is a clear limitation. Another thing is that there's not really any coherence between the examples. Maybe it will learn over time, but for example, things like including type hints um, or uh, other best practices that you wanted to use, it might not really do that. For example, I now had to explicitly tell it several times to include type annotations because, well, most of the Python code that's on the internet doesn't use that yet because it's a pretty new feature. So that means if you want to make sure that they're using the best practices, well, JetGPT might not always provide you with those because it's basically learning from the past. And finally, that also has to do with all of these prompt engineering tips is that you really have to know how to ask it the right questions because, well, in the end, tools like this are reactive. They're not going to do things on their own. Basically, you have to ask it the right things. You have to provide it with clear directions of what you want. And in that sense, it's the same as searching with Google. So that means that if you don't know the right keywords or you don't know the right way of phrasing the question, you're not going to get the answer that you're looking for. And asking questions is a great way to learn, but if you don't know the right keywords, you might end up in a bubble. For example, if you don't know the keywords of low cohesion and single responsibility, well, you might not ask the questions in the right way, and then you won't get the answers that you're looking for. So in the end, tools like ChatGPT are really useful, but you have to always be aware of the limitations. And I think we're pretty far away from it actually being a complete replacement of senior developers and we all lose our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. And that's mainly due to how these generative AI models are really working on the hood. So I'm quite sure that in the coming years, this is going to improve a lot. I'm really curious to see where this is headed, but this is definitely something for you to be aware of. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to learn a bit more about how to become better at Python and get some suggestions, some ideas for fun projects to dive into, check out this video next. Thanks for watching and take care.